So our next speaker is Piyush. Piyush is from Pune, and he's been uh, writing in writing Go code since 2011, and he's uh, contributed to KDE and Go Chef. I was talking to him for quite some time. I was trying to figure out, dude, tell me something, something that people don't know about you. He made this statement, which I'm going to read out verbatim, as is. I'm proud to be a partner in three successful shutdowns. And that is pretty freaking amazing, because the amount you learn when you shut down is probably magnitudes more than when you actually start up. So uh, he's a runner, he's a cyclist, and he's trying to learn football on his PS4. All right, Piyush. Am I audible? Oh, great. Okay. So, well, it would be unfair if we have a conference in 2016 and 2015 which doesn't deal with microservices. It's in such an important topic, and we have abused it by talking about it so much that it's become the least important thing now. But anyway, uh, since it would be a sin and as a redemption, let's talk about microservices uh, and services based architecture. Uh, how many of you are aware of what service-oriented architectures are around here? And I'm sure in some way or the other, you would have used it in some manner in a production system, right? So, but just to do a quick recap, since most of you are already aware of what a service-oriented architecture is, uh, what are services? Uh, services are pretty much uh, logical entities which run independently away from other code units. Uh, so think of them like processes on an OS space. Uh, they don't interfere with each other, run absolutely independently of each other. Uh, they can be written in multiple languages as well. So you could have a service which could be running in Ruby. There could be another service which could be running in Golang, Java, or anything, but they're still running in the same system. A services could be comprised of more services together as well. Let's say you build a notification service and that comprises of smaller service, one of them being a SMS service, the other being a push notification service, another one being an email service. Uh, services can span across multiple servers as well. Uh, this is where the distinction is. Most of the times people get confused with services being multiple server deployments, but one service could be comprised of larger number of servers as well. Well, today, Servers we expect to go down almost all the time. AWS outages, any Linode outages, DigitalOcean, I don't know if they had an outage, but they, they tend to go down. Services are expected to stay alive irrespective of all of that. That's the beauty of services. Uh, and that gives you scalability and flexibility because from suddenly from a monolithic single system, we have moved across a horizontal system where you can add more and more servers to a service and it can go on and on. So it takes load for you. Uh, why do we use service? Someone on the internet beautifully said this, to error is to human, all of us make mistakes, but we have to find someone who do we blame it on. Uh, so one part of services is software problem. While it provides us function point scalability, which I'll explain in detail as I go forward in the talk, uh, la the management also tends to like service-oriented architectures because now you know who is the person who has the authority and the responsibility, and in case something has gone down or failed badly, now you know who to point fingers to. Uh, jokes apart, but in case there's someone who is actually, when you take up a service, you are solely responsible for scaling, deploying across every system, and then it becomes a lesser failure chance. There's not one guy sitting in a vacation on Hawaii who has the SSH key to the production system and you can't do anything about it. Like any other software architecture problem, we have design patterns for microservices as well. Uh, and this is pre precisely what we are gonna discuss now. Uh, and how a library that we have written in Go and across other languages as well, helps you address these design patterns. Just as a convention, since the library runs heavily on Redis, any destination publishing would be done through topics. And well, since real estate is very expensive these days, everywhere I refer to library Gilmer, I would call it capital G, and an instance would be referred as small g. Asynchronous signals and slots. Uh, how many of you have word heard of 
queued signals and slots comes from KDE. Okay, a handful. So now, asynchronous communication is precisely the foundation of most of the microservice architecture that we do. It's, it's kind of important because we come on to the synchronous part that would also consume asynchronous in a way. Uh, let's say we are building a small, uh, take an e-commerce website, a commercial one, right? There is a web system. Web could be, you would write to call it a client or you would like to call it a web front end, whichever way it is. Basically something which sends in a request to the backend, which is responsible for dispatch across various servers. Uh, the complexity of these could be large, so we'll only take a sample example of an item being purchased, and if you have to send out notifications, how you would do that. Uh, let's say I purchase an item. Uh, now the message has to be sent. Corresponding to every purchase, you're supposed to send out an email notification and an SMS notification. You have designed two services around it. The message comes in, you send it across to both email and SMS. Now, uh, suddenly the management takes a beautiful decision that this app would work only on mobile. Uh, people have done that in Bangalore. Uh, so now, all of a sudden, you realize that, oh, I have to send push notifications as well. So you add a push message server to this. So now we have email, SMS, and push notification. Uh, then you have uh, online Mela going on to a heavy discount, heavy sales. And for a particular, uh, before that, since we promised that we'll talk topics, every single message now that is being sent out will add design a topic to it. So when you buy an item, it sends a message to item.buy.500. 500 is not a HTTP error code, it's just an ID. Uh, and then you have certain topics. Now let's see what the star is. Now if you buy an item, you would like your services to process every single message that is coming in. So we introduce a thing called wildcard topic. So item.buy.star. So if item.buy.500 comes in, then as well it would be processed. If item.buy.600 comes in, that would be processed as well. So these services are now capable of handling pretty much every request that comes in. So this is important, wildcard topics. How this compares against HTTP is that this is something that you cannot achieve over HTTP-based transports. Now, that online mela, heavy discounts. Now for a certain particular VIP item, you have to refund, let's say 15% of the amount to the customer or give them bonus or something, whatever. And that's only available for a limited period. So you introduce a new service, you call it VIP item purchase, and that's item.buy.420. Now if a request comes in, which is item.buy.420, since everything else was a wildcard topic, all of them would be processed, as well as item.buy.420 would be processed. Now, as the months went by, we realized that the push message server is receiving heavy load and we need to scale that up. So we add more servers across this. This pretty much becomes your function point scaling as we have been talking. Now you can add more and more servers. However, there's a large problem here. Since for a particular request that came in, every server would want to greedily process the request and you might send out three notifications instead of one. So you pro we introduce a concept of mutual exclusion groups. Uh, in this case, we'll call it push message group. Now, what they try to do is they try to acquire a distributed lock, uh, a lock by using Redis itself, and only one message would be processed by each of these server groups. So despite having multiple servers, if a message comes in, only one, it would only be processed once. Uh, so Let's say if I was to scale SMS notifications, I would add another server, write parallel to SS notification, create a group called SMS underscore message, and that would give me function point scaling across SMSs as well. So this is pretty much what signals and slots are. Let's take a sample example of how I would do this using Go. Uh, if you cannot read the code, you can probably check the slides later, but you can use the screens on the side. So you create a Redis backend, Next up, the very second line is I create a small g, a Gilmer instance, using the Gilmer library. Then I define a g dot slot. I define the topic, which is example dot log here. And there's a handler, which does a certain something, which has two parameters, request and response. Uh, response is pretty much invalid because it's a slot. You cannot send anything back. And uh, in the, the second half of the slide, you can see I create a line and I signal it. So important part about signal slots is that you don't care about whether or not there is an active slot for it, so your message can disappear. 
request response. Request response is pretty much an extension of the same topic that we're talking, uh, but it's more traditional and conventional way that we have been dealing with web. So you send in a request, hello, and you get a request ba answer back, which is aloha. Uh, now, there could also be a case where you might get a wrong number, uh, which is not the correct output. That's an error condition. Now, how do you differentiate good data versus bad data? One way of doing this is that we actually parse the response every now and then, and we see, uh, does this match the valid output? Is this a JSON, or is it a string? To avoid that, in Gilmer, we have this concept of code and sender ID. A typical message that is transmitted throughout Gilmer is of this format. Uh, it's a structure with a data, which is the interface that you send in. There's a code. This, for convention, we use HTTP codes, just that we don't break what HTTP standard has been. So if it's 200, we mean everything is working all right. If it's anything greater than or equal to 400, then something is going bad. Sender ID. To exclusively identify each message, there is a UUID called send, uh, sender ID, which is attached to every message here. Uh, a typical request response pattern would look like this. We create a new data, and G dot request is that it starts serving request on that topic, which is called echo. Uh, in the second half, uh, that's a request that I'm asking. I'm sending a message to echo, and I have a handler right next to it, uh, which would process the response and just print it. The response part is what the actually the other part of the service would be, which is saying that I reply to echo with this handler. A message comes in, and it says response dot set data. So you get in a request, and it just takes that message. It's a dummy thing. It doesn't do much here, and sends it back. Uh, interestingly, in Gilmer, request response has also been implemented using asynchronous pattern. So when you send in a message, it creates a dynamic slot. And that slot is what it waits on a message on from the service. Uh, typical question is, when do we use signal slot versus request response? Well, this is heavily discussed. And I think pretty much what we concluded was, based on who is responsible for the error, is the deciding factor of what do you use against what. So if the caller is responsible for handling the error, you would use request response. Whereas if the service is responsible for processing the error and going ahead with it, you would use signal slots. Uh, another common part of such microservices is error detection and handling. Well, things will definitely go wrong. I can vouch for that. And you need a way to monitor when something is going bad. Uh, so Gilmer provides you a way to handle these errors as well. First of all is timeouts. You could have a server-side timeout or you could have a client-side timeout. Server-side timeout is actually a cap on a particular process, which says that it cannot run longer than this duration. It could be a video transcoding going on, which might cost you money, and you don't want to run it for more than 30 minutes. Client-side timeout is that you sent in a message, but you want uh, a message, an acknowledgment well within a minute or whatever time. Otherwise, you don't care about it. Based on the implementation of the library, the process could preempt or it could not. As turns out, and go, go routines are not preemptive, so those will continue to run. Uh, whereas in other language implementation, the process is killed as well. Then there's a confirmed subscriber check. What it allows is for you to actually see while requesting an answer, is there an active listener for this topic or not? And in case there isn't, it would raise an error straight away. Uh, so a typical error flow would look like this. We go back to the same example. You send in a signal, the slot receives it, forwards it to the error. Same is the case with the request response as well. It forwards it to the error. A uh, typical error structure looks like this. It has topic, request data, user data, sender, timestamp, backtrace code, which you can pretty much deal with. I'll show in the next slide what it does. Uh, in terms of error handling, you could decide to do three things with your hand errors. You ignore. You say, I don't care. You could publish them to another slot, which is uh, gilmer.error. So if I set an error policy in my Gilmer server and say protocol.error policy publish, then all the message error messages shall be published to gilmer.error. You could have another listener, which is uh, another slot listener. And these signals would be trapped by that listener. And the third one is queue. Now, this only works because right now we have Redis as a backend. You could queue all your error messages and later fetch them uh, using Redis, standard reader stuff. 
Uh, this is a, a sample of what an error message looks like. This is from a production system. We take the errors and we send pager duty alerts out of it. Uh, monitoring. While servers have a standard way of monitoring of log forwarding, error reporting, server and health monitoring, which is pretty much uh, a de facto for all servers that you install, services have a unique way of being identified. You say, are, are my services running? Do my server services have spare capacity? Do services respond well in time? To tackle this, in Gilmer itself, we have a plugin called Health Bulletin. This service constantly registers your ident of each Gilmer consumer that is out there and constantly sends a message on gilmer.health. It's a topic that each of your client libraries is actually subscribed to. And then it watches for whoever did not respond. Whoever did not respond after three failed attempts is marked as a failed node and you're notified about it on gilmer.error itself if you have a valid listener there. Uh, this is another example of are there active subscribers to these topics that are pretty much important in my system. So over here, uh, there's a sample pager duty alert again of request.manager.restore.cassandra. There's no listener for this and hence it raises an error. Uh, one of the other interesting things about microservices is that you should be able to play with them like Lego blocks. Uh, twist and turn them around, create bigger things out of it. So this is what we call microservice composition in Gilmer. You should be able to compose services and other compositions as well. So a typical compose, which is actually a, a straight ripoff of Pike from Unix is service one sends the output to service two, sends the output to composition three. Now each of this composition could be any one of these other things as well. There's an and and which only proceeds if it's pretty much uh, Unix stuff. The only exceptions being here are or or and parallel. Or or with only will stop when the first service returns something which is 200. In terms of parallel, all of them would be executed in parallel and there is no guarantee of which order do the messages arrive in. Let's take a sample of how would you do composition. So this is an example which I'll give you a working demo of later. Uh, so I'm creating a composition where there is the first, so if you look at batch, I create a new pipe. The first request composition is example.fetch. So this thing is going to fetch a file from S3. It has a huge amount of text in there. It passes that output, that string, to example.words, which is going to split that string into an array of words. The next is it sends that pipe to example.count. The count is going to count the number of words of each type in that array. And then there is a popular parallel composition. I'm going to compute how many uh, popular three letter words and four letter words exist in this particular file. Uh, then I create a new message and I first, the since the very first service that requires the message is an input of the S3 file, I do that. The output of every composition will be a pipe. If the, uh, will be a channel, sorry. Uh, a channel would keep giving in case you are running a parallel execution where you might have multiple returns. In case it's a single return, the channel would be a buffer channel of uh, uh, cap one. Now to extend a composition is fairly easy. Let me introduce a couple of more compositions in here. After the words have been computed, I'm actually going to add a stop filter as well which is going to remove the A and B, et cetera, words, which are pretty much insignificant. Then I'll add another parallel composition to it, which will compute the popular five letter words. Then there is a my composer. My com so composition is an interface. Uh, in the previous talks through the day, you have seen how interfaces help you build extendable and robust code. This is an example of that. Uh, now let's see a working demo of what Gilmer does. The first example is, uh, I don't know if you can see this because the font is probably too small, but I'll explain, I'll narrate it verbosely what it does. So on the left is I start a first server. It's an echo server. Then I spin up another server, echo server. Then I have echo client. Echo client sends in a message at every 300 milliseconds. And both the servers are in parallel, take turns to solve the request. Now, since both of, this is an example of function point scaling. Because both of the servers have an exclusive lock over the topic, only one of them is guaranteed to solve. Uh, let's take this to a better and a stronger example of what we just discussed. 
of the this is the sample text of that file that I'm going to download from S3 and uh, we'll run it against the same composition as we discussed. Uh, so here's the demo. I spin up the first server. Then I spin up another server. At this point in the bottom hand right you would see a log listener. So this is a slot receiver for gilmer.log. Each of the services as the process message is going to send out messages to gilmer.log. So once the client starts, the first step is it downloads the file. The next step, it splits it into words, the string. The third step is it applies stop filter to it. And all of this is being done parallelly by both the servers on the left hand side. Once the word count was there, it sends it in parallel to both the servers and it finds the number of popular words. So in this file, the most popular three letter words were way and far. Most popular four letter words were text and copy and most popular five letter words was blind and blind. So all of this uh, is something which is can be accomplished using Gilmer and it's pretty easy to extend it. Uh, so if we just do a quick recap of what Gilmer is, it's a library. It is not an external process, so you don't have to run an external process. Uh, it supports asynchronous messaging using signals and slots. It supports synchronous through request and reply. You can scale it, the function point scaling, and it, is, it allows exclusion groups. It allows wildcard topics. Then using health bulletin, you can have error and health monitoring. Failure detection through timeout and also confirm subscribers. It allows real microservices to be done using compositions. And since there is no server here, we are talking about no message persistence. Uh, well, you can check the source code on GitHub. Uh, and you can also meet me outside for further details for this. This is available across multiple languages as well. Uh, there's a native port where it actually started, which was Ruby. Uh, then I extended it over Golang, and there's a Java port as well, which is available. So using Gilmer, you can actually have uh, services which are done in either of these languages, and they can still talk to each other. Uh, there's credits, uh, Aditya, this guy has been helping. He's the co-author of this library. In fact, he started this up, and he's been helping me out throughout this project. And Data Skill, the company that I work for, and that is where we use this heavily. Thank you. All right, thanks, Piyush. Questions? Hang on, we're not going to let you off that easily. <laughs> Questions? So when you functionally scale, as yes. explained, you. so uh, how do you decide which request needs to go to which server? Uh, so whichever is available to process it first would do it. So, so, it's a, are available. so, how, uh, how yeah, so that's where the exclusion groups come into the principle. So since one of what they do is they try to acquire a log based on the topic and the exclusion group. So the log would only be allocated to one of the services. So both the services try to achieve that log, but whosoever comes in first gets the log, processes the message, while the other one just carries on. All right, we got one more question here. Yeah. Um, so how does it here? Yes. Can you raise your hand? Yes. Yeah. So how does it communicate? I mean, uh, what is the actual communication mechanism when it uh, talks between the oh, process? I mentioned that it's, it's, uh, it uses Redis subpop underneath. Sorry? Redis subpop. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, just behind you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so how do you handle discovery when, let's say, the push uh, servers are you know, horizontally scaling? Uh, how would uh, the person, who, uh, the machine who sends the message know? Right. Uh, so the last example that I showed you, so there's a first server coming up, there's a second server coming up. So each server that comes up actually defines the topic that it wants to respond to, or in case it's a slot, how many slots it is willing to serve. So each of those services out there, uh, don't think of them as servers, think of them as services. So they commit to co serve a few of those services, and then the exclusion groups and everything takes over. Yeah, but for the client to understand where the... So the client doesn't care which server am I sending it to. That, see, that's the part. It's not HTTP, where you know which URL you are hitting. You send a top message on a particular topic, which could be a signal or a request response pattern, okay. and then you get the result. You don't care which of those servers physically was processing it for you. Uh, so uh, my question is that uh, 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 can you explain a little bit more about that? It's a 
uh, librarian, not a process, because uh, I'm familiar, a little bit familiar about uh, with RabbitMQ and Kafka. So how it differentiates from those? Uh, well, RabbitMQ it differentiates actually quite a lot because uh, you don't have compositions there. With Kafka, you don't have dynamic slots or topics. It's quite a rigid format. Also, you won't get wildcard. I don't know if you support wildcard topics there. So, and of course, composition is again not present there. Uh, so, and request response. So, it's not something that you will give you a response right then and there. Uh, it's a when I say it's a library, it's not a process. You just have to run a readme server somewhere. You write your code and you include the Gilmer library. So when you start your engine, in case you're using Ruby, you could use the event machine. In case of Go, you could just use a wait group and keep listening on it forever. And you start spin up your process. And those process, whatever you have written, will subscribe to each of these service endpoints that we call as topics in Redis. And that's all about it. All right, thanks a lot, Piyush.